Grace and peace to all of you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is four questions that the Holy Spirit had the Apostle Paul write in his letter to the Romans, chapter 10. So then, how can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one about whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? The word of the Lord. My dear friends in Christ Jesus, what a privilege. What a privilege for me to be your guest preacher this weekend, on the weekend that the whole Christian church across the world is talking about the ministry of the gospel. What a privilege for me to serve you every day as our Synod's Administrator for Ministerial Education. That is, I'm responsible for all the schools and programs that train the next generation of pastors, teachers, staff ministers, and missionaries. Before I served you in this way, I served you for 15 years as president of Michigan Lutheran Seminary. That's a boarding high school in Saginaw where students in grades 9 through 12 already at that young age are willing to be trained for the ministry of the gospel, willing to consider being pastors, teachers, staff ministers, or missionaries. Pastor Gowell attended that school while I was president there. In fact, over a thousand students graduated from that school while I was president, and over 500 of them went on to become pastors, teachers, staff ministers, and missionaries. I would see them well, they had just been confirmed, typically. Just finished eighth grade, coming the beginning of ninth grade, squirrely, unmotivated in many cases. And then I got to watch them mature and grow so that by the time they graduated from high school, they were able to take prayerful, make prayerful decisions about how the Lord might use them in the next part of their lives. We would begin them on the first day of ninth grade reading the Bible. Start them on Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And then if they did all their assignments, they would read every verse of the Bible in a guided way until December of their junior year where they would finish the last verse of Revelation. And we would have a semester of New Testament church history. And then they would come to my class, the senior doctrine class. And I would say... Well, you read all those Bible verses. How do they apply to you today? How do they apply to college students? How do they apply to young people considering vocation and marriage? And I told the students that they could ask any question they wanted, and so they did. We answered many questions in that senior doctrine class, that capstone class. And I think because I had that experience with them, that's why so many of them have stayed in touch with me after graduation. Sometimes they contact me and say, President Prangy, can we still call you that? Uh, I just want to tell you what's going on in my life. Or, President Prangy, I lost the notes from your class, and I know we talked about this, but uh, can you remind me? Or, President Prangy, thank you for these notes. I've been using them. It's been a wonderful help to me. But sometimes, sometimes it's, President Prangy, we came up with a question today that I don't remember ever talking about in your class. And one of those that came to me on social media from a graduate was, President Prangy, did we ever answer this question in your class? How is it fair that God would send to hell children who never had a chance to hear the gospel? Pretty good one, huh? How do you answer that question for yourself? How is it fair that God would send to hell children who never had a chance to hear the gospel? I'll tell you how I answered it. I began my answer by saying to my graduate, Atta boy, way to go. I can tell by the way you ask the question that you're remembering this basic truth of the Bible. That at the end of life, when God decides who goes to heaven and who goes to hell, it's based entirely on faith in Jesus as Savior, right? Whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except by me. Peter preached it. Salvation is found nowhere else. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. So I said, attaboy, way to go. Keep that in mind. Now, let's see if we can answer your question. Go back to those first days of ninth grade. Remember when the first human beings, Adam and Eve, fell into sin. What did God do? He immediately made the promise of a Savior who was to come. And now Adam and Eve can pass on that promise to their children and they to theirs. And everyone can know about this. Perfectly fair. But that chain was broken. There came the time of the flood where people had just ignored the promise of the Savior. So then you had Noah, his wife, three sons, three wives, eight people in all in that flood. And after the flood, from them come every nation, tribe, people, and language we have today. But they knew the promise of the Savior. And God put the rainbow in the sky to remind them of the promise of the Savior. And they had this promise from the Lord. And so they could pass that on to the people who meant the most to them, their children. And children could learn that from people who meant the most to them, their parents. And you have an elegant solution to the problem. But people broke that chain, that gospel chain. And so when Jesus sent his twelve, after he rose from the dead, he said to them, Go, make disciples of all nations, wherever that chain has been broken, baptizing and teaching. And the Christian church has taken that very seriously. Going to places where now you grandparents and parents learning once again about the Savior can pass on that message to their children. I thought the message was long enough to my graduate, so I, I sent it off and took him a while, and then he wrote back and said, all right, I will admit that if there are children who've not heard the gospel, it's not God's fault. He has an excellent plan. It's human beings who have messed that up. But you, talking to me, have to admit that there are children who have not heard the gospel. And I did. I wrote him back. And I said, and then he quickly responded. He said, How does, doesn't that make you feel bad? And I said, when the Bible actually deals with that question, how do you feel when you know that there are people who have not heard the gospel? It asks four questions. How can those people call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one about whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can those people preach unless they are sent? And then I wrote to my graduate, that's a chain. Where do you fit in that chain? And I'll ask the same question to you, assembled here this morning. That's a chain. Where do you fit in that chain? That was not the first time my graduate had heard that, quest, that uh, example. When he was a freshman in high school, we brought a world missionary into his classroom. And that missionary explained that it's hard work to leave where you grew up and to go to a place where the people may not act the same or may not talk the same. But it's so satisfying to restore that broken gospel chain so that grandparents and parents can pass on the message of the Savior in their culturally appropriate ways in precisely the language that they use in their home. When that fine young man was a sophomore, we packed him up on a bus with all of his classmates and we drove 14 hours across the Midwest to Martin Luther College in New Ulm, Minnesota, the Wells College of Ministry. And we said, this is where you go if after high school you want to continue training to speak that gospel to whoever can hear it. And then on the way home, we stopped in Wisconsin at Luther Preparatory School and Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary and said, LPS, Luther Prep, Watertown, Wisconsin. It's a school just like yours in Saginaw. Those students are thinking about being ministers of the gospel. And Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, if you want to be a pastor, that's where you go after college to finish off your pastoral training. 
And then we returned home, and that young man had something to think about, something real. When he was a junior, we brought the MLC, the Martin Luther College people, to him and to his parents. That school in Saginaw, Michigan is a boarding high school with students from all around the nation, all around the world, really. And we made sure we had all the parents come in. This is what we found. Lots of young people are willing to think about being pastors, teachers, staff ministers. They especially like the idea of being missionaries. But their moms are not so sure. They want that young person to be more than an hour or two away when the first grandchild is born. And their dads are not so sure that they want to pay for a college education because they know how pastors and teachers are paid. It's by the free will offerings of people gathered on a Sunday morning and they say that sounds too sketchy to me. So the MLC people, they're used to hearing these things from moms and dads. And they explain there are sacrifices, but the sacrifices are worth it. To have a teacher with Jesus at the center of everything in the classroom, reminding a student every day of the love Jesus has for him or her. To have a pastor who's with you through the good times and bad, and not speaking stupid stuff, but telling you precisely what the Lord himself wants you to hear. And with you there on the deathbed as the angels come to take you to be with Jesus, nothing more valuable. When that young man was a senior, we sent him out to a place where the people looked different from him and talked different from him and said, look, Jesus is for those people too. Understand, he's for the whole world. And then by the time he was a senior, he was old enough, we could say, you know how you were naughty last night in the dorm? Jesus welcomes you with open arms and forgiveness. Not that you deserve it. And not that any of the people you go to church with deserve it. Who sometimes nod and smile and then walk out continuing whatever life they had decided to live. But here is the grace of God for you. That Jesus warmly welcomes you with his love and forgiveness no matter what state of life that you're in. And I want you to notice that the question my graduate asked is turned on its head by that truth of the scripture. <coughs> he was right. We had never asked that question in my class because that question has a false premise. Remember the question? How is it fair that God would send to hell children who never had a chance to hear the gospel? If God were fair, he would send all of us to hell. None of us deserve to go to heaven. But the real question is, how is it fair that I know about Jesus Christ and I was placed for adoption into my childhood family that taught me? How is it fair that you know about Jesus, your Savior, and trust in his forgiveness as there are people driving by at this moment who do not know about that special truth of the Savior. How is that fair? I was reminded of that one time when I had an unbeliever in my classroom. Normally all the students were believers thinking about ministry of the gospel, but every year there was a pretty good chance I would have an unbeliever in my classroom on Student Council Exchange Day. We were in a conference with other high schools, public schools, and every year we'd send our student council to those schools and they would see how a particular school runs their student council. And then that student council would send their student council, that school would send its student council to my school. They thought they were coming to see how our student council worked. We would bring them into my senior doctrine classroom and whatever the lesson was for that day, I'd throw it out. And instead I would teach the great exchange, student council exchange day, the great exchange. Are you familiar with the Great Exchange? It's a simple way to tell people about the Savior, and I always taught the Great Exchange in four parts. So I was getting ready to teach the Great Exchange on Student Council Exchange Day, and in came the group from the public high school, and there they sat, and one of the girls was wearing one of those Muslim headscarves, Shador. 
And so I thought, well, clearly practicing Muslim, I wonder if she's ever heard the Christian message before. So I was particularly clear that day in trying to explain how this all works in four parts. Part one, God in heaven is absolutely holy. He says nothing unclean or impure will ever enter here. So you have to be holy to get to heaven. God says, be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. Be perfect as I, the Lord your God, am perfect. He gives us the Ten Commandments. And he says, I want you to keep every one of these in everything you think, everything you say, and everything you do. Knowing that people want to water them down, he says, no, I'm very serious about this from the largest thing to the smallest thing. And the one who does all these things is the one who will live. Part two. God looks down from heaven and sees no one is perfect. No one is righteous, not even one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And actually, the news is even a little worse than that. You get paid for your sin. You get a wage, as it were. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, not just separation of soul and body eternal separation from God in hell. Part three, human beings hear these clear messages of the Bible and say, well, there must be something I need to do about it, so I'll just compare myself to him. Uh, you know him, he's not that good a person, he has some bad habits. He's not that serious about trying to be good, but I wear the right robe, this is how they talk. And I stand in front of church and I say the Bible. So if Jesus comes right now and has to pick between him and me, he'll certainly pick me. Do you see the flaw in that? God didn't say be better than the next person. He said, you be absolutely holy. And if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Okay, people say, I get what you're saying, but... Early on in life, I did some bad things, but recently, I'm eating more salads, not drinking so many beers, I'm climbing that ladder, that stairway to heaven, and, well, I haven't done anything major bad lately, so I think I'm ready for God to take me. Do you see the flaw in that one? Sins done early on still count against you on that need for perfection. And right now, you always do what you're supposed to do, you never do what you're not supposed to do? That's just lying. Oh, people say, all right, I get it. Every time I do something wrong, I'll try to do something right to make up for it. It's probably like a giant scale. So I do something minor bad, you know, a little cussing or anger. Or I'll do something minor good. I'll, uh, I'll pay for the person behind me in the line at the McDonald's drive through and uh, I'll do a special offering to church. And if I do something major bad, well, I'll ask for forgiveness, and I'll do special acts of kindness and goodness, and on this giant scale, on this idea, you know what God says about those good things you do to try to make up for the bad things? He says, all your righteousnesses are like filthy rags. They actually don't balance it out at all. The bad still weighs us down. Part four, seeing that there was nothing human beings could do to solve the problem, God said, I know what to do. And he sent his only son into the world. The second person of the Trinity from all eternity took on human flesh and lived an absolutely perfect life. Did you know that Jesus never sinned? Never had a bad thought? never had a bad word, never had a bad action, refrained from all of those things, did everything he was supposed to do his entire life. So at the end of life, what does Jesus deserve? Instead of taking the heaven that he deserved, Jesus took the hell that we deserved. God made him who had no sin be sin for us so that in Him we become the righteousness of God. God placed the sin of the entire world on Jesus on the cross. He took the punishment there for it, the hell. And then, 
through faith in Jesus, we have his perfect life credited to our account, and that's the ticket to heaven. He, we did not live it. Nothing we do can mess it up. And that's why we're so confident in our salvation through faith in Jesus. It's based on his perfect righteousness. Just then the Muslim girl raised her hand. I should say, that's the exchange. God exchanges my sin and gives me his holiness. And the Muslim girl, completely understanding what I was saying, raised her hand, and I called on her, and she said, that's not fair. It's not fair that someone else should be responsible for our lives before God. Each of us should be responsible for our own lives before God. And I answered, you're exactly right, it's not fair. That's why we call it grace. That's why we worship the one who did it for us. That's why we call ourselves Christians. That name Christ right there. My dear fellow Christians, by grace, you understood that already. By grace, you come to worship here knowing that you will hear that your sins are forgiven. And through faith in Jesus, your Savior, you have heaven assured. By grace, you pool your resources in this congregation to support the work. And by grace, you pool your resources with 1,300 other congregations across the United States to support the work of training pastors, teachers, staff ministers, and missionaries, and sending them out wherever they're needed, across the state, across the nation, across the world. By grace, you are part of this chain of calling, believing, hearing, preaching, and sending. You are called supporters, wonderful, beautiful. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news of priest, peace who preach the gospel of good things. And by grace, there are some of you sitting here this morning that may be able to serve, even full-time, as a pastor, a teacher, a staff minister, or a missionary. There'll be people who support you all along the way if you're willing to try to do that. It's a tremendous opportunity that's available to you now. What an opportunity. What a privilege. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.